this is really uh, something that I was thinking about um, about this time last year um, when we were at the Serendipity Society Conference in London and it's a thought that I keep coming through and developing. I'm super interested to hear people's thoughts and people's feedback afterwards. Um, I'm not too sure whether the arguments all hold up and I'm really, really happy to have them picked apart as much as possible. Really what I'm looking at is I'm coming at this from an experimental psychologist point of view, not a philosopher's point of view. And what really I'm looking at is, okay, so this, this phenomenon of serendipity, what does it mean for what I investigate and for how I investigate those things? What does it mean for the way that we've been doing these things within the lab? And so, yeah, so it's accidental thinking. Right, I'd like to start um, just with this scene here. Um, this comes from Herb Simon's book, The Science of the Artificial, and I'll just read it out to you. We watch an ant make his laborious way across a wind and wave moulded beach. He moves ahead, angles to the right to ease his climb up a steep dunelet, detours around a pebble, stops for a moment to exchange information with a compatriot, and thus he makes his weaving, halting way back to his home. He has a general sense of where home lies, but he cannot foresee all the obstacles between. He must adapt his course repeatedly to the difficulties he encounters, and often detour uncrossable barriers. His horizons are very close, so that he deals with each obstacle as he comes to it. He probes for ways around or over it without much thought for future obstacles. It's easy to trap him into deep detours. Now, this argument that we see here, then takes, it's the start of Simon's argument for reductionism in cognitive science. His point here is the behavior of the ant in this instance mainly comes from the complexity of the beach. So complexity for Simon here is driven by the environment. And in his theory, then, the true and proper study of cognition is to strip away this environmental complexity and focus on the internal processes. Now, an awful lot has moved on since 1965, but this underlying structure still exists in many psychological investigations. The environment is seen as an unnecessary complexity. Experimental psychologists are rather looking for the foundational building blocks of cognition, which then, un when uncovered, can be scaled up and will be the same no matter how complex the environment. The argument I'll put forward here is that the anecdotal and the somewhat limited lab-based evidence for serendipity suggests that this cannot possibly work because serendipity is inherently relational and so the complexity is a necessary part of understanding cognition. So as a good baby philosopher, I'm going to start by defining my terms. Um, what's a higher cognitive process? Now, anyone that knows me will know that it doesn't take very long before I start asking them this question. I've spent the past two years trying to find a steady definition of what it is. Quite often, I'm just been told, well, it's the bits that are in the second half of the cognitive psychology textbook, the lower ones at the bottom, higher ones at the top. That's how it works. Um, I've had this definition, which Diego wrote in 2019, asked cognitive scientists what the highest form of cognition are, and most will agree, they are mathematics, language, planning, and decision making. Um, I've been sent one recently, um, we use the term cognitive processes to, defy, to refer to the types of processes that are investigated in cognitive scientists, science, broadly construed. Examples include higher cognitive processes, such as cognitive control, memory, decision-making, social cognition, mathematical reasoning, and language understanding. And that's from Kirchhoff's book on extended consciousness and predictive processing. As far as I can tell, higher cognitive processes are those things which require us to think, which seems slightly, slightly um, naive and simple, but it's the things that require these effortful processing. But what's clear as well to bear in mind is they're not natural kinds. Decision-making requires planning, possibly requires some mathematics, definitely probably some solving of problems in there. But, you know, we have a lecture on decision-making, we have a lecture on problem-solving, they appear in different lectures on different days of the syllabus, so therefore they must be different things. But actually when you start to look at them and you unpick how they unfold and you're trying to study them, 
they, they merge and they blend the whole time. Now, one of the things that I study, which is one of these higher cognitive processes, which is problem solving. When you and I encounter problems, we are always situated. Problem solving is a richly contextual and situated thing. It's heteroscalar. The, the solution of the problem often emerges from a, a mix of people and things. It's often unexpected. It's often not necessarily recognised as a solution until it's been enacted, until it's been tried out. Sometimes it's not even recognised, as we've been talking about just previously, for a really long time afterwards. Other times, the solution may even be generated before the problem arises. So this relationship between solution and problem is non-linear and it's not easily traced. Now, to go back to how problem solving is solved under Simon's idea about how we need to reduce these things down, the problem solving examined in the cognitive psychologist lab is nothing like this. The field of cognitive psychology is, perhaps unsurprisingly, dominated by cognitivism. So, broadly speaking, this means that the belief that behaviours supervene on internal physical states and that cognition is best viewed as information processing, modelled on the way that a computer um, processes information. What this means is that problem-solving algorithms are produced, which posit normative ways of solving problems, and then these models are tested by presenting participants with tasks designed to elicit a certain cognitive response such as an insight problem, which might be designed to elicit the feeling of impasse or being stuck. So you might have a problem like the water lilies problem. Okay, so the water lilies problem is, is, is a common problem. It's presented in various different ways. Um, water lilies double in area every 24 hours. At the beginning of the summer, there is one water lily on the lake. It takes 60 days for the lake to become completely covered with water lilies. On what day is the lake half covered? That's the problem. Um, what we often find is that people are start thinking, well, it must be half covered after half the days. Actually, if you think through it more, it's 59 days. It's not a problem that I've ever encountered in my real life, that's for sure. I've never really looked out of my window and gone, oh my goodness, there's water lilies. They look like they're almost half there. They're gonna cover my whole pool. How long is it gonna be before they're half covered? There's not something that happens that's not the sort of problem that we look at because we're looking for problems that will assess these fundamental building blocks and will then scale up. Because really what we're operating under is this um, methodological solipsism. The cognitive psychologist wants to know how the machine of the brain works on all types of information. There's no doubt that external environment influences these cognitive processes, but it's the extent to which they influence which is under debate. And essentially, if all that they are is recruited or used or just an influence rather than a constituent part of cognition, then we don't really need to look at them. Reductionism works, it's fine, it's efficient, it'll be great. On the other hand, if we believe that the body and the world are part of, they, they form part of the substrate of behaviour and cognition, then we need to really take the environment into account. So this is more important than it might necessarily seem in a very practical way, because what happens is when we believe that we can assess problem solving by looking at the reduction, the reduction of the small underlying cognitive processes, then we choose easy to use problems to give people. So this explains this productive research program into problems and riddles, which most of us would view as being a hobby, something to do on a Sunday afternoon, um, do Sudokus, I've seen loads of work on Sudokus, on riddles, on various different things that you might do. What happens then is we have this, this big, difficult, uncomfortable circularity. So the process and the method of testing the process become collapsed. And so we test higher order cognition through observing how people solve problems, which must mean, surely, that we solve problems through higher order cognitive processes. So when someone solves a problem, they're displaying this higher order cognitive process. And we know it's a higher order cognitive process because, well, they've solved a problem and problem solving is at the top end of the textbook, right? So we're all fine. Rather than actually looking at the, the nature of either what we'd like to call higher order cognitive processes or problems, 
Instead, we're just stuck in this slightly damaging loop. Of course, not everything has got this internalist way of looking at things. There's definitely since um, Clark and Chalmers with their extended mind, um, this form of active externalism. There we're going to go. The external world is really important. We need to take it into account. Active externalism suggests the external world forms part of this cognitive system. Um, it's in contrast to passive externalism, which posits the external world as important for content. Rather, when we've got active externalism, it's important for process. And so it becomes important when we're studying these things, when we're researching these things. But even under this, the dominant view is agent-centric. We often hear the agent recruits these things. Things work as scaffolding. Um, cognitive processes will flow to where there's the lowest cost, but the assumption being that they will flow from an agent. So there's a residual Cartesian dualism that just hits the whole way through. The agent is a recruiter and a thoughtful selector of the external world. The external world is also in this, uh, under this narrative also beneficial. It's always going to help you. It's always going to be useful. Again, I'd like to question that this is really what happens when we fully 100% engage with the idea of the external and internal being mingled. Um, I want to go back to your ant thought. Remember, this is a complexity in the environment that we're not going, that we're not looking at anymore in problem solving. And I want to take you through the discovery of the um, structure of the double helix. I spent the rest of the afternoon cutting accurate representations of the bait out of the bases out of stiff cardboard. I quickly cleared away the papers from my desktop so that I'd have a large flat surface on which to form bases of pairs held together by hydrogen bonds. So I initially went back to my like with like prejudices. I saw all too well that they led nowhere. When Jerry came in, I looked up saw that it was not Francis and began shifting the bases in and out of various other pairing possibilities. Suddenly I became aware that, you know, excuse my um, chemistry here, a D9 D mine pair held together by two hydrogen bonds was identical in shape to a, another sort of pair um, held together by at least two hydrogen bonds. All the hydrogen bonds seemed to form naturally no fudging was required to make the two types of base pairs identical in shape. Now, what I enjoy about that is it's almost the human equivalent of Simon's ant. Here, the discovery is made not through, while the external world is recruited, the external world is also active in this as well. The seeing happens of something that happens outside of the body. You because the awareness happens outside, it is an observational thing. The external world is as important. Now, when it comes to creative problem solving, and creative problem, is pro so problem solving is probably the, the biggest thing that we like to think about, the highest possible cognitive process. Oh my goodness, here's the point where we're gonna generate a new thought. Can we be any higher in our cognitive processes than this? Well, when it comes to the thought of creative problem solving, I think this obsession with the internal and where it arises internally is really hamstringing all our research into it. Um, Olson in 2018 writes, the, the main puzzle of creative cognition is that it can produce novel concepts, beliefs, and problem solutions and products that are not in anyone's prior experiences. How is this possible? Where does the novelty come from? And, I completely agree, it's a, it's a massive puzzle. If all we do is assume that novelty has to come from internal processes, then oh my goodness, how does it come from? Creativity is the generation of something novel and useful. I'm reminded of all the conversations we had yesterday about, about knowledge and how you can know something that you don't know. Well, if creative cognition is the moment when a thought is generated, then perhaps, Perhaps that rather than the puzzle being that this thought can be generated inside from nothing, maybe the puzzle stems from the view that cognition is best understood as a closed system. Maybe rather, if we restructure this whole idea that we have and instead posit this open cognitive system distributed over the cognitive resource of the cognizer and the material and social world in which he finds himself embedded, then this question becomes irrelevant. 
novel concepts, beliefs, problem solutions and products, they arise from outside of the system. They come into the system. Novelty arises from shifting and dynamic entangled states in which object and people with different centers of agency form transient systems. And it is the interaction, we've talked about this interaction, this perspective taking with these, that new thoughts arise. And from this, serendipity then becomes really, really important. It emerges in this interaction between a person and an uncertain and changing environment. From the perspective of the environment, the shifting cogs of a complexity will necessarily yield moments of chance in the form of accidents, the roll of the dice. What becomes really important about serendipity and why it's particularly important when it comes to creativity or problem solving is that actually we're not responding to the role of the dice in serendipity. Rather, we're like poker players. The concept of serendipity is such that luck is there, but it has to be enacted by a certain skilled agent. So from the perspective of the person, it requires this act of noticing the chance and the personal characteristics that so many of the people that are in this audience have written about and thought about, sagacity, a prepared mind, a network around them to exploit the opportunity. Thus, serendipity is truly emergent and systemic. Both the internal and the external processes are necessary and neither is sufficient on its own. And so therefore it collapses the boundary of the two. If we seriously take serendipity into account, then we are actually forced, I believe, to abandon this residual Cartesian dualism that says we either recruit the environment or that we can just look at our internal processes. In serendipitous moments, the environment is it's not an influence, it's not harnessed in the service of the explicitly delineated human mind, nor is it a sole generator of ideas that are merely observed. Instead, it forces us to dissolve these boundaries of agency and to redistribute epistemic credit both across both internal and external forces. Now, all we need to do to start saying this is something that we actually need to take into account in our models of cognition and our models of problem solving as it unfolds is to find evidence for this. There is plenty of anecdotal evidence for the existence of serendipity in research and discovery in the existence of coming up with novel thoughts. I put Alexander Fleming up here. Um, I think hopefully most people in this room will be aware of why he's here for serendipity. He discovered the, he accidentally discovered an antibiotic. We all know from different people's work on this that that, that serendipitous moment, that accident had to be reified, had to be grown upon, had to be built upon by a series of networks. But he's not the only, only evidence for serendipity in discovery and research. I think it was, a, um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten, Campanile's research on the citation classics, where about 10%, just under 10% of scientific discoveries reported within these papers come down from serendipity. It is important if we're trying to work out how people actually solve problems, how people actually do research, and how people actually create innovate, innovation and novel thoughts. Um, the same is true for creativity if we talk about a material creativity. Creativity is always an enacted thought, whether we enact it through speaking to somebody, whether we enact it through speaking to ourselves, whether we enact it through writing, through drawing, through a really close collection with material, there is an action because otherwise you haven't created anything, you've just, you just are. And when we start looking and talking to people that are creative in a, in a, in a way which involves engaging with materials, then there's a lot of challenging of a person-centered notion of creativity. Instead, here, creative agency is spread often across materials. What we hear, what we read about is that objects are, have, have an agency that means they often resist intentions of the artist. They ask questions or they might change the original plan. There's a collaborative relationship that sometimes collapses in places and things don't really do what they want. Moreover, we can go beyond these qualitative and anecdotal evidence to actually watch serendipity unfold in the lab. Now, I'm hoping this is going to work for you. When we take serendipity, when we take 
um, these problem solving things and we take them back into the real world, then we start to see people responding to movements that happen in the environment. Um, Fleck and Weisberg noticed it um, when they did a, a, a lot of work on um, how we solve insight problems. And they came up with the concept of data-driven restructuring, which included incidences when the individual changed his or her representation of the problem in response to something he or she saw from the physical configuration of the problem. And they did this because for some of their problems were presented with movable tokens. Um, so you no longer had to internally process things. Instead, you could recruit the, the external world. But what happens with data driven restructuring is it's not that the external world is actively recruited, but that the external world also helps. And I have this video, which I hope will play, which gives you quite a good example of how we can see this happening. Okay, so you don't seem to have sound. <laughs> Um, unless you can hear something that I can't. So I'll talk you through what's happening. The um, participant has got seven letters and she needs to make words out of them. And the first word she makes is death. And by making the word death, she leaves three letters over. That's C, O and T. She notices though, she hasn't planned those. There's no way you could create an algorithm that would predict those things would happen from the internal processes. She sees them and she notices them and then she acts on them and she uses them. So in this small problem, the, there is a moment of serendipity when an accident is recognised by the participant and she moves forward. Now, oh, I'm going to go back and see if it all over again. What are the implications of this? I'm not suggesting that every single problem that we solve is solved serendipitously. I'm not suggesting that everything is accidental. I'm not suggesting even that everybody always recruits or uses the external world. I've seen enough people sit in absolute silence, not moving and generating the answer to a problem to think that that would be naive. I, all I am suggesting is that this this way of viewing problem solving and this way of viewing cognition has dominated research and therefore we have models which take this one aspect and ignore all the other aspects of cognition that happen in complexity and therefore these models of cognitive processes which dismiss the environment because it's either too complex or it's not actually important because it doesn't affect what's happening inside because everything we do inside is mediated through representations anyway. I think they will fail to explain much more that happens outside of the lab. And I think they will fail to explain situated problem solving and discovery. And instead we'll end up running around a simulacrum of those processes and they will be unable to scale up. I don't know if this is the case and I'm super interested to um, hear what you have to say about it. Thank you very much.